legally, a wilderness area is um, defined by the Wilderness Act of 1964, so it has specific objectives and mandates. Um, so a wilderness area has to have naturalness, it needs to be undeveloped. Those are just some of the things that are inside of the Wilderness Act. But wilderness, and on the other hand, is anything that, that you think it is. You know, for most folks, I think wilderness is any sort of uh, forested wild lands. Um, and that's, that's correct, too. The King Range National Conservation Area covers 68,000 acres and extends along 35 miles of coastline between the mouth of the Matol River and Sinkion Wilderness State Park. Here, the landscape was too rugged for highway building, forcing State Highway 1 and the US 101 inland. The remote region is known as California's Lost Coast and is only accessible by a few back roads. The recreation opportunities here are as diverse as the landscape. The Douglas fir peaks attract hikers, hunters, campers, and mushroom collectors, while the coast beckons to surfers, anglers, beachcombers, and abalone divers. King Peak is the first hike that I write up in the book, and I like King's Peak for, for many reasons. The first of which is it's a nice, gentle introduction to conifers. The trees have always intrigued me. I've always enjoyed finding trees in unique places. And conifers are interesting because conifers are an ancient lineage of plants. They've been around on Earth for over 300 million years, and they've evolved to fit different climatic changes. And as they've evolved, they've moved around the landscape. And where you find conifers today tells a story of deep time. Up on King's Peak, there's actually not a lot of conifers in the King Range. Um, but there are Douglas fir. Douglas fir basically blanket the King Range. And the, the cool thing I think about the Douglas fir and the King Range is they're sculpted by fire. Fire has, has moved them around the landscape and they survive in certain areas because of the fire effect. So we're gonna start at Lightning Trailhead, travel up Lightning Trail. You either go through Maple Camp up to King Peak or go to the right to King Peak, come back down, catch King's Crest Trail, catch up with Rattlesnake Ridge Trail, Travel down that, catch Big Flat Creek, go to Big Flat, Miller Flat, and then travel along the Lost Coast Trail. We met up with our good friend Paul. We got dropped off and it was just us out there, no, but no one else around. We had just supplies for three days. Hey, once this guy goes, it's all on us. So something really impressive about the Lost Coast Trail is as you're hiking through that trail, you're actually transcending from a tectonic regime of transverse motion, so the Pacific Plate sliding past North America, to um, a zone where the Gorda and Juan de Fuca Plate, remnants of our old subducting slab, are moving underneath where we live, the North American plate. And that creates a huge array of geographical and geomorphic differences in the topography of the area. So you have these small rolling hills south of the Mendocino Triple Junction, Shelter Cove, um, Cape Mendocino area, and giant hills just blasting into the sky north of that. That's all due to the Cascadia subduction zone. Well, what should you bring to King's Peak? You should definitely bring some water. You should definitely um, be ready. For, it's not a long hike, but it's a steeper hike. Um, but you should definitely bring either a copy of Connor for Country or download uh, the write-up that I have online. So what I've done in the book is I've mentioned some highlights and I have a map included. But if you go to my website, you can download very specific almost step-by-step -step directions about what you're seeing along the way, what, what plant this is, or, or you know, what turn to take. The main part of my job as a wilderness ranger for BLM is to be out there um, in the wilderness making contact with, with folks from the public that are out there recreating, making sure that they know the rules and regulations and being safe and also not damaging resources. So I keep a blog, it's called uh, lostcoastranger.blogspot.com and I use that to help get information to the public that may be searching uh, for more information about the Lost Coast before they go out there. A naturalist is, is, I believe, someone that engages with the natural world and their their journey is to understand it, their quest is to understand uh, what they're seeing, to answer questions that may come up. And really that's what a scientist is as well. And I think science is based in natural history. Science has shifted a little bit today, maybe to the more quantitative 
we use a lot of numbers as scientists today, maybe it, it, to the detriment of natural history rather than the qualitative. And I really feel that um, natural history is about those fundamental observations, understanding relationships, asking questions about relationships in nature, um, and, and really developing a sense of place. Well, it's kind of something I've always wanted to do since I was a kid. You know, my dad take me around to national parks. Like every summer we'd go on these long road trips. And so I went to Humboldt State University and studied natural resources planning, um, the emphasis in recreation. Someone that comes to my mind um, as far as an explorer, especially in this area in Northern California, would be probably John Muir. So John Muir was one of the first great naturalists, American naturalists. Um, he ended up in California in the late 1800s as a sheep herder and uh, trekked across from San Francisco, trekked across the Central Valley, which he described as uh, what he would expect the African savannas look like, full of wolves and grizzly bears and elk. He was one of the founding members of the Sierra Club, and he, he was fundamental in securing both Yosemite and Sequoia Kings Canyon as a national park. But I think what John Muir really did that uh, lives on for me is, was his, his natural writing. He wrote about his experiences in the natural world. He wrote about the trees. He wrote about Yosemite through his eyes and as someone interpreting that landscape for the first time for, a, um, for, for really a nation. Interesting thing about wilderness is, um, for example, you can't use chainsaws inside of a wilderness area. And oftentimes folks will ask me about that, um, you know, why I'm out there with a saw instead of a chainsaw, you know, clearing trees off the trail. Wilderness offers us a place, a refuge to go, a sanctuary uh, away from these machines where you can go and experience the sights and sounds of nature and know that you're not going to be hearing, you know, an automobile driving by or a chainsaw going off uh, in the background. You can just really just commune with nature. I think we all choose um, if, we, if we want to be in a relationship with our surroundings, our environment or not. A lot of people are, are just disconnected with it. Um, you really don't need to go on any trails or go to the beach or go to the Lost Coast. You can be exploring and feel connected wherever you are. It's just opening up your eyes to your surroundings. <laughs> Why not? Where are you boys racing to? To the top. Ah, oh, it's beautiful up at the top, all right. But you boys just might want to slow down a tad and take the time to appreciate where you are right now. Here? Look at that perfect iris right there by your foot. Wow, I didn't even see that. It's really important to use a bear canister when you're traveling overnight in the King Range to respect the wildlife. Um, so you want to have all your food and scented items in there, such as sunscreen and toothpaste, and store that when you're at night and anytime you're away from your backpack. Um, and this, like I said, helps ensure that the, the bear isn't getting into human food and coming around campsites more often and becoming aggressive, and it keeps them wild and keeps them out eating their natural food like they're supposed to be. Here we are, King's Peak. We're almost at the top of the hill, just another quarter mile to go. So we definitely do get snow up here as the King Peak's about 4,088 feet. So, especially on the north facing sides of the slopes, it uh, can get a lot of snow and actually make hauling the trail rather difficult. I could fly right into the ocean from here. We're up at King Peak now. As you can see down that direction to my right is uh, Big Flat and the Lost Coast Trail and Battlesnake Ridge Trail. It's along that crest there. And we got Shelter Cove behind us. 
It's going to be base camp tonight. It's really important to get a lay of the land before you go on any hikes or anything. Mostly, um, you gotta you gotta make sure you have enough water. And if you run out of water, you need to know where, what kind of water sources are close by. If you need a filter or not. Um, also for camping, most places you can't camp anywhere you want. There's designated camping spots, so it's really important to plan ahead and you know ch check out the lay of the land. I gotta, you know, go to the John. Can you go, pal. What? No way. Make sure you dig a hole at least six inches deep and bury your teepee. What, in the bushes? That's too close to the stream where we get our water. Use the wet sand of the intertidal zone. You gotta be kidding me. The ocean has billions of bacteria to break things down. Don't turn your back on the waves! Well, it's important for people to leave as little impact as possible when they're out hiking in the King Range to respect, you know, other visitors that do come here. So that way, you know, when they enter a campsite, there's not all sorts of trash lying around. Um, when they're out hiking the trails, you know, they don't encounter uh, negative things that are going to impact their experience. The common rule of thumb when you're out backpacking for etiquette is leaving the campsite better than how you found it. Um, just look around, even if something, maybe you didn't leave it there, but if you could take that along with you, that helps out a lot. Backpacking in the Lost Coast, I've heard that it's pretty extreme, very mountainous, and I had only hiked around on the beaches, never up in the mountains, but um, just, it was breathtaking, the vistas, and having those extreme mountains right along the shoreline, there wasn't really that many people out there either, it wasn't that crowded, it was, it was amazing. For me, the outdoors helps me to forget my troubles and focus on the necessities. It allows me to remember that we're a species just like any other and that we have an inherent need to use our bodies, not just in the gym, but to actually go somewhere, see something, and rediscover what it means to be a living being. You live in the country, I live in the town. You live in the country, I live in the town. You shake your foot, my hope falls down. You sleep in the pasture. I sleep in the barn You sleep in the pasture I sleep in the barn You light the hay And I buy the old farm Dust didn't make the dust all tragic It's people who propagate I think we can become better stewards by first going, getting outside. Um, that's, the, that's the main first step. You get outside, you have a good time. The second step, I think, is to ask a question when you're there. And I feel like as we begin to understand those connections, we begin to develop the natural history in all of us. We begin to find that again. And uh, that grounds us in reality. That shows us that the natural world is, is part of us, and we can grow with it. We can protect it. We can get to know the animals that live there. And all of those steps are going to lead us to care just a little bit more. So I've had a few encounters with bears while I'm out in the wilderness. Uh, one time I was, I was camped and I w just happened to wake up and it was a full moon so I could see pretty well. And I was like, right when I opened my eyes, I saw this bear walking about five feet to my right, past me, went over to my bear canister, which was about 25 or 30 feet away, he did a lap around it, and then came back uh, on my left side a couple feet away and, and took off. Nothing ever happened. He didn't try and get into it or anything. I think he just checked it out and realized, it's, oh, it's one of those cans. Okay, I can't get in there, uh, which is what we want. You know, we want the bears to, to learn, learn that behavior. 
But anyhow, it makes me wonder how many times I'm asleep at night and a bear comes around my camp checking things out, and I don't even know. If you're planning on hiking from Lightning Trailhead to Shelter Cove, um, we did it in, t in two nights, and we were really um, moving it each day. So I would at least give yourself um, probably two to three days, two nights, three days, um, from Lightning Trailhead to Shelter Cove. Um, and you also have to factor in the, the tide, too. Other dangers that you might need to look out for are the impassable sections at high tide. Um, so you need to have a tide chart, know how to read it, and figure out where you're going. I find my job incredibly rewarding. You know, on one hand, I, I'm able to be out in, you know, one of the most beautiful places in the United States or the world. And either way, it's an incredibly beautiful place where I work and, and I live. And also, I'm helping to manage America's public lands. And I think it's important for people to remember that you know, these lands are America's lands. They're your public lands, literally. You own them, they're yours, and you should go out there and recreate on them, um, go explore them, and cherish them, and help preserve them. There is now a common perception in our society that as humans, we could decide whether we want to interact with nature that our engagement with the natural world is a matter of preference. The reality is that our common need to know more about the earth is stronger than ever before. Connecting yourself to the world around us isn't a matter of accomplishment, but understanding. John Muir wrote, tug on anything at all and you'll find it connected to everything else in the universe. Where else is there in the vastness of space more comfortable than here? The more we heighten our curiosity about the world around us, the more likely we'll be able to increase the longevity of our only home, planet Earth. The wind kept up all night long, opening doors for spirits gone. I swept out the leaves that blew in. City men come to crash the garbage cans taxis horn is glued to the driver's hand